Hello, the practitioner here. Bachelor of Science student, chemistry major, mathematics minor, magician, parapsychologist, technical agnostic, Fortean skeptic, and member of the Cosmocratic movement. Ah, uh, where to begin with this episode? Uh, for the most part, Penn and Teller actually did a much better job than I was thinking they were going to. I thought they were going to. I thought they were going to start taking away, uh, taking apart space exploration six ways from Sunday. Okay, well, luckily, like I said, I was expecting a lot worse from. I was expecting a lot worse job from them, uh, owing to their screw up with global warming than they actually did. So, not to worry. The um, for the most part, this episode was pretty good. However, I do have to. Um, I now have to go in and start mentioning um, some things. Number one of which. The um, the issue about um, the, the one of the experts they brought in, who was a professor of physics, um, said that he didn't believe that it was possible that the human race would have a future in space. Um, that's where I have to disagree with him. Um, I'm posting three references in here, um, one of which is a um, reference to a paper from the uh, IEEE, which is the uh, main journal for electrical and mechanical engineers, which talks about uh, one of the most, uh, done back in 2003, which talks about one of the most recent reviews, which actually shows that not only are rail guns uh, feasible, um, there's, there are actually alternatives to rocketry, um, which are feasible. Uh, I'm also posting the link to the Cosmocratic website on here, which has a uh, reference list uh, to NASA and a whole bunch of other um, sources, which say why it is essential that we um, colonize the asteroid belt, um, you know, again, for our future. Um, I'm also posting a link to um, uh, to a uh, BBC documentary, which shows that they um, that NASA actually already has a contract going out right now for um, you know already has a contract going out for building a railgun. Which uh, yes, uh, again, one of the uh, one of the benefits of private industry is that they may have access to resources that NASA might not necessarily get their hands on. The the um, the problem, however, is because of the fact that this is a um, uh, this is a private contracting thing. The question is, you have to be aware of. Um, you know, who's getting control of it at the end. And, uh, anyway, long story short, this is where my dis uh, my major disagreement with this episode has to come in. Um, well, actually, there are three disagreements I have. One of which is the fact that humanity will never have a future in space. As I've stated before in previous videos, and I posted in the Cosmocratic website, if we do not get a future in space, the human race does have a strong possibility of, um, having technological society grind to a halt due to pure lack of materials. Penn and Teller themselves did an episode on recycling about uh, three seasons ago, which demonstrated the environmental byproducts of that and why it's not an effective, uh, why it's not an effective technology. I mean, if we don't, if we don't have recycling capability, we don't even have a capability of slowing down the um, uh, the um, the uh, grind to a halt of technological society. If we do use recycling with better treatments, um, we'll still only have a uh, an efficiency level of say like even maximum 80-90%. Which means they still uh, still a, tech, a slow technological gear down. Now take into account the fact that we have to consider the fact of a growing population and a world and a decreasing world poverty line. You know, a, a decreasing world poverty level. So this way, um, you know, we are trying to bring up the standard of living to the, for the rest of the planet. Uh, you know, we have to be able to go off planet in order to be able to get enough materials to sustain our level of st our standard of living for the entire planet and simultaneously. Um, cut out the environmental damage by moving heavy industry right to where the asteroid belt is. You know, cut the, uh, you know, uh, cut out the extra transport of shipping raw materials back um, to build stuff on Earth and just simply move all, uh, move all heavy industry up into space. You cut uh, pollution of, um, uh, um, since interstellar space is a non-environment, uh, you know, you can't really pollute a non-environment. Anywho, um, that's, but that's a side note. Um, that's the first one I have to mention, and again, like I said, I'll be posting sources over here, um, including benchmark tests for that, and um, I'll also be, uh, um, also I want to mention, uh, before people start commenting on, well, we don't have means of living in space yet, I want to make something perfectly clear. There was a project done at the University of Columbia uh, a few years back called the Biosphere 2 Project, and the only reason that it failed, uh, at least that they were able to tell at the time, was because of the fact they were using concrete walkways and uh, the carbon dioxide got caught in the concrete, meaning it didn't keep, uh, keep uh, meaning that it didn't get um, kept in as part of the cycle. You know, um, and most of the other complaints, like oh, the uh, like the people who were living in there not being able to uh, uh, be sane after a couple of months, I'm going well. What about the people? What about the guys? Uh, what about the people who live several months up in the ISS? I mean, the place there is more cramped than a biodome. You know, that, that stuff gets failed to take into account. Now, the thing is that um, 
there's a group in France right now, I've, I've forgotten uh, their names, but and I don't have the reference for them, but they're currently working out a couple of the glitches that were there in the Biosphere 2 project. And if private industry took over that project and rapidly tried to develop it, no doubt we would actually solve a large chunk of these problems, including, um, you know, relevant, uh, sea, um, uh, relevant ratios of sea life to uh, terrestrial-based life, and we could have a proper self-enclosed biodome working. Um, for the moon and the like, um, this problem's already been effectively solved. Um, uh, a guy recently developed um, capability for, um, I can't remember where I saw this, uh, it's another YouTube clip. A guy recently developed um, a, capabil a machine which actually can condense moon rock and bring water out of it. There's enough I uh, oxides and hydrogen and, you know, and hydrogen and the like on, on the moon to be able to build, uh, you know, to be able to get the basic necessities of life like water, oxygen. Uh, they can ship up a little bit of biomass from Earth. You know, self-colonization, uh, you know, it, um, Self-enclosed biodomes are being uh, researched. We just need to step up the research on them. Um, and okay, but anyway, uh, long story short, like I said, the rail guns are already being built. Um, they should have one ready by 2010, which would mean at least for mass payload issues, um, that wouldn't be a problem. And the good news is, though, is that if uh, if private industry is building, um, you know, craft which can shoot to low Earth orbit, or even, uh, you know, then that at least solves the problem of manned space explore, uh, you know, uh, of transport of humans up to uh, low Earth orbit. Um, as for the practicalities of interstellar, um, uh, sorry, of interplanetary flight up to um, Mar uh, Mars and the like, uh, there have been some concerns about, well, rockets are too, uh, you know, rockets are, uh, you know, like the rocket costs are going to be severely um, problematic. Well, according to the paper I put in here, at least for mass payloads for when uh, launching off the Earth, um, the space shuttle right now uses about $20,000 per kilogram, um, which, you know, is like several million dollars in that $17 billion a year. Uh, budget is where a large chunk of that goes. However, if we used a railgun per launch, and we're not talking um, preconcept here of, of designing the spacecraft, but again, what we've got heat shielding and the like, that's currently also being researched. Um, but with that, a railgun would actually cut the cost down to something like $500 per kilogram, just purely off electrical energy that is even already available. Um, and again, is already being built in the, according to this contract. Now, the next couple of things I have to disagree with are the um, two accidents relevant to the space shuttle. They're claiming that NASA never learned from these, and I'm actually going to um, quote a couple of things which are uh, are which may which o were overlooked by this episode. Again, minor points, but these but these are very crucial when considering how effective Na an organization NASA is or how well it learns from its mistakes. Uh, the first one is that uh, with the O-rings. After Richard Feynman actually did that demonstration, uh, you know, and annoyed the people at NASA, they actually changed the design of how the um, of how the O-rings connect between the um, uh, the main, uh, the solid uh, rocket boosters, the main fuel tank, and the space shuttle itself. Uh, so this way, um, that particular problem has actually been corrected for since then. Uh, Columbia Space Shuttle, yes, that was a problem with the foaming, and NASA had a problem with that. However, I'd like to actually draw this back to. Um, I'd like to actually draw the political climate back, which might actually explain something in relation to, uh, and this actually says not just about NASA culture, but this actually says a lot more about our, um, about our government's lack of willingness to properly uh, explore space. And I'm not talking NASA, I'm talking the, uh, the Senate and the Congress who fund NASA. Back during the 1970s, when, uh, like, actually before Space Shuttle Challenger was put in, like, when they were first putting in the Space Shuttle, there were two designs being considered, one of which is the current design now. The second of which would have cost more up front, but would have actually solved a large chunk of these maintenance issues and would have actually had a lower operating cost over the longer run. Guess what happened? The Senate, who were, uh, the Senate who were forced to uh, choose the, uh, the appropriate design to tell NASA what to build, again, for funding reasons, um, they were coming up on an election year, and they were worried about, uh, about spending too much money, um, you know, about, about uh, too much uh, you know, uh, improper government spending, Yes, and uh, so anyway, as a result, you know, they were worried about not getting voted back in. So what did they do? They picked a cheaper upfront design. Space Shuttle Challenger in Columbia, accidents that happen as a direct result of that. But here's another thing I'd like you to consider. Accidents are always a part of, uh, accidents are always a part of, uh, are always a real possibility of space travel. Um, the Geminis had one or two glitches with them, uh, you know, that never really made or happened. But there was a, p a craft called Apollo 1, the very first Apollo spacecraft that was supposed to go as a test orbit, um, that was supposed to test into uh, low, low Earth orbit before shooting up, you know, to test the rocket system before it was designed for moon, lunar travel. It blew up on the launch. Sorry, um, it blew up on the launch pad, killing the first three, uh, killing the uh, three astronauts. Is this NASA's fault? I don't think so. You know, and that happened before they got the uh, Neil Armstrong to the moon.
You know, these, these are possible engineering glitches which may happen in space travel. If people die from, uh, from space travel, and this includes in private industry, you know, um, where humanity has a real future in space, then they're giving their lives in the name of science. And isn't that something worth fighting for? For the collective survival of our species? Just my thought on it. Toodles.